Hello everybody, welcome to another video and today we are hearing from another expert on a subject. During one of the dry dock episodes there was a question raised about U-boats, specifically about U-boats lost from uh, air attack in World War One, and from that developed a conversation with someone else who was watching the video and it turns out that they are in fact, know an awful lot more about that subject than uh, than I do, or probably uh, quite a lot of us do. <laughs> um, so with that said, let us introduce uh, Michael Lowry. Um, perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. yourself. Yeah, I've been researching U-boat related topics for about 20 years now. I handle much of the World War I material for the U-boat.net website. I also work extensively with divers and others to locate and identify submarine wrecks, both British and German, primarily from the First World War, but every now and then I have to deal with World War II issues related to that as well. Also get to solve some ship sinkings, fun stuff like that. Awesome. Most people's interest in U-boats finishes when the U-boat finishes its active operational career, whether that be through scrapping or through rather more dramatic means in the middle of a war. But there, there's still a lot more to be learned, uh, especially since, as I'm sure we're going to cover, sometimes we're not entirely sure why a U-boat disappeared, uh, for at least for a, certainly for a long time. So for those of you who have seen or listened to some of the other videos I've done previously, uh, such as the one on the Zero, we'll be running under a, a similar format where we have uh, talked about a number of questions and uh, I will ask questions, I'll throw comments in and uh, Michael will provide answers to enlighten us all. So uh, with that said, let's get to the first question. In terms of the U-boat fleet at the start of World War One, what was the size of that fleet and their general war aims? Because obviously this would have been the first major conflict involving a, a submarine fleet. Well, as to the number, on August 1st, 1914, U-29 was commissioned. So 29 U-boats. And the general war aim was fairly simple. The Germans expected the Royal Navy to blockade them and blockade them near their own coast. So just off the German coast, in other words. And the idea was for U-boats to act as submerged torpedo boats in this struggle against British warships right off, right off their front door, basically. So the expectation was fairly short patrols, close-in actions, things like that. Okay, albeit obviously it's uh, 20 or so years earlier, it's a similar kind of anti-fleet operational role that the Japanese thought their submarines were going to be used used for in World War II, albeit obviously with this expectation of the, the close blockade, which had been the British fleet's sort of staple strategic tactic for probably the better part of the last two centuries. Yeah, very, very much so. They're, they were really expecting a close-in fight. And there was very little thought about using you know, submarines against merchant shipping pre-war. So a, a small fleet, if well, if 29 ships, you're talking about maybe two to three flotillas worth. And as you say, you, it's expecting to be used as underwater torpedo boats, obviously with somewhat slower speed. So with that caveat in mind, what were the basic capabilities of the U-boats that they actually had? Um, because I'm imagining they're probably not as capable as the classic Type 7 or Type 9 that we think about when we're thinking about the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II. They're more capable than you would think, but we need to divide that 29 up. It's not 29 of equal capacity. The first four are basically, you know, instantly outdated and just training boats. U5 through U18, so 14 boats, are powered by what you would call paraffin and what I would call uh, kerosene. Uh, engines, which are less modern, and these boats would have two bow and two stern torpedo tubes, 
for 17.7 inch 450 millimeter torpedoes. And the later bo boats from U18, excuse me, U19 on are diesel powered. The diesel powered boats were more capable than you would think. They would be good for patrols of up to a month. Okay. Wow, that's that's considerably longer than a tor than a surface-based torpedo boat. Yeah, they. Ha I mean, it's kind of a lucky happenstance for the Germans that they, you know, were expecting close in fight, but the boats they ended up building had sufficient capability to operate effectively in the Atlantic or to sail from Germany all the way around into the Mediterranean to the Austrian po uh, ports in the Adriatic. Okay, right. So, yeah, so, uh, well, I suppose considering it, we're talking, what, just over a decade since the first practical submarines have been introduced into naval service, that, that that's actually quite a, quite a significant step change in technology from something like a, a Holland-type uh, submarine that's that's really only good for harbor defense, assuming you don't have any particularly strong currents. Yeah, the evolution in technology is breathtaking in general in naval technology, but it's particularly in submarine technology. Also, it's worth mentioning that those diesel powered boats are not particularly slow. They're capable of 15 to 17 knots, depending on the type on the surface. Yeah, so that and that that obviously might sound that sounds fairly slow to people who are more used to maybe the World War Two or modern era, but but we obviously we have to bear in mind that that's only a, maybe a knot or two slower than the average pre-dreadnought battleship, um, and a, a lot of the older ships that would have been in service with the various navies probably would have struggled to reach similar kinds of speeds. And it's also more than fast enough to run down most merchant ships. Yes, that's true. So, yeah, suddenly put in mind uh, the uh, armed merchant cruiser Otranto was considered a fast, a fast liner, and it was only capable of sixteen knots, and and it was specifically selected for armed merchant cruiser service because of its above average speed for for a civilian vessel. Yeah. Okay. So obviously, you, you mentioned that. That their initial tactics and aims are as a, very much as a fleet component um, going after warships as opposed to merchant ships. But obviously, um, outstanding incidents like the Abukir, Hogan, Cressy being sunk aside, they're most widely associated in both world wars for going after merchant ships, which obviously suggests the tactics changed. So how did the war affect the the, the tactics? Was it a kind of oh, the British haven't shown up off our coast, I guess we're going after the merchants, or was it a bit more nuanced than that? Well, yeah, it's a little more nuanced. A couple things happened. First of all, the Germans gained confidence with their submarines, exactly because they're going out and being successful in taking out cruisers. You know, they sink like six cruisers in 1914, and then formidable, battleship formidable on January 1, 1915. So submarines are developing or showing their potential. Also, you start to see some of the new uh, diesel boats go on longer patrols, like a trip around the British Isles. So the Germans are starting to see their submarines as an effective weapon system beyond just, you know, 20 miles off Helgoland or something. And at the same time, you they basically make a political decision that, well, they're subject to a blockade that they didn't expect. I mean, they weren't they were expected to be blockade, but not from afar. So they decide to counter this, what they regarded as being, well, basically illegal to, in their eyes, blockade with a counter blockade. You blockade us? No, we blockade you. <laughs> and how could they do that? 
Well, they can do it with submarines. Now, do they really have enough submarines in early 1915 to be effective at that? Not particularly, but they tried. It's also a couple other details we need to get into here. The nature of the patrols change. When U-boats are out hunting warships, oftentimes their assignments are very well defined. They have specific patrol stations or they're in a sweep where they're supposed to be operating a couple miles apart, something like that. And the patrols are fairly short. Once you get into patrols against merchant shipping, then the patrols get longer and the U-boats assigned operating areas oftentimes are much more random. We're not say, well, not random, but at the commander's discretion. Okay. So we'll frequently see that one of the issues is, well, where was this U-boat supposed to operate? And the answer is sometimes, well, half the English Channel. Somewhere over there. Yes, somewhere over there. And the exact definition of over there can change. I see. And yeah, that's a complication for sure. And there is no really central control. Oh, yeah. So, it's, so, so again, it's not like World War II where Kriegsmarine. Uh... High command is radioing and back and forth and getting reports off of the U boats. It's kind of, well, um, he shall be on the horizon. I, I guess we'll see him in a while. Yeah. And there are some differences that we're going to get into between different command areas. A uh, couple, couple other ways in which you know, the operation changes. If you look at the picture, of you know these pre-war U-boats, mm -hmm. you'll notice that they don't have deck guns by and large. Yeah. What happens in the spring of 1915 is that U-boats are fitted with guns. And those are going to be for the U-series diesel boats at first 88 millimeter guns, 30 caliber, um, in collapsible mounts, which look completely ridiculous. <laughs> and then when we get into 1916, they get traditional type mounts. And also 1916, some of those boats are upgunned to a 105 millimeter gun, 45 caliber, very impressive looking weapon. The 8830 is not. So U-boats acquire gun armaments that are significant for the time period, and that is used to stop merchant ships. Uh, of course, and I suppose that that probably link into the length of the patrols, because I suppose you're not going to surface and challenge a warship with with a single deck gun, and so you have to rely on torpedoes, which a small U-boat of that period, I'm guessing, is probably not going to have too many of, whereas, as you say, with a, with a merchant ship, you can stop and possibly even sink them with a deck gun, and you can fit a lot more shells in a, in a U-boat than you can torpedoes. Yeah, well, also, the threat is very useful. Sometimes you can't, you couldn't get into a firing position for the torpedo, so the U-boat would stop and shell its target or threaten to th shell its target. Oftentimes, just firing a shell across the bow would force a merchant ship to stop. And then the U-boat, you know, can send a couple guys over with scuttling charges and sink the ship after the crew had gotten into, you know, into the lifeboats. It was very common in 1915, 1916. So kind of they're still operating under cruiser rules at that point. Yeah, they are. But even in 
1918, you see some of that if, you know, the circumstances are favorable for the U-boat, they'll still surface and use their gun to command the situation and scuttle ships, small ships mm -hmm. then. But that's very common. Uh, another quirk, which is going to seem completely bizarre, is going to be torp is going to be torpedo type. Now there's a break in torpedo size when it comes to U-boats. The first boats up through the last kerosene power boat U-18 have the 45 millimeter, uh, 45 centimeter rather, torpedo tubes. From U-19 on, it's the 50 centimeter torpedo tube. It's a 19.7 incher, okay. same as the latest German destroyers. Torpedoes are a high-tech weapon for the time. Merchant ships do not necessarily require the latest, biggest, baddest torpedo to sink. So until 19, early 1918, the U-series boats are carrying a bunch of different types of torpedoes, some of which are 19.7 inch, some of which are 17.7 inch fired with a rail put into one of their normal torpedo tubes. Oh, okay, so it was like a, like a, almost like a torpedo sabo? Yeah. Yeah, it's very bizarre, but that's what they're doing. So they're firing subcaliber torpedoes, essentially. And I guess because they, then they can fit more of those on a, in a sub. Well, torpedoes are expensive, you know, it is definitely a high-tech item, and they've got a bunch of older torpedoes sitting around that, you know, front-line destroyers aren't using anymore. Okay. So, you know, you can use the older torpedoes up on your submarines. Yes, yeah, so we've, we've paid for these weapons, and we can, we can use them in this, uh, in this application, I guess, at that point. Yeah, well, if you... Stop a 3,000 ton merchant ship, and you're concerned that it might not sink fast enough if you set scuttling charges. Well, you can send it to the bottom much quicker if you put a torpedo into it after yeah. you cut off. And gee, uh, a 15 year old torpedo is probably good enough to do that job. <laughs> Yeah, turn of the century merchant shipping, not known for their subdivision. Yeah, so that's what they did. They did okay. a lot of that. And I should also mention the importance of mine laying. The, oh, yes. Ger <laughs> the Germans, German naval doctrine emphasized mine laying, and not just on submarines. If you look at their light cruisers, they're fitted with mine laying capability. Their destroyers, torpedo boats, can lay mines. They built two mine laying cruisers. Unsurprisingly, the Germans would also build submarines during the war that were fitted for mine laying. One tenth of the ships sunk by U boat during World War I were mined. Uh, and and that would include the obviously the the only British dreadnought battleship that was sunk by enemy action. Um, Audacious, I know, was sunk by mines. Yeah, by that mine. was... <laughs> Although that was a that was laid by a ship, wasn't it? Yeah, that was laid by a surface raider. Yeah, you uh, both laid mines do claim some significant victims. Obviously, HMS Hampshire. Yep. Lord Kitchener on board. Yeah, your country needs you, but I need a lifeboat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's an example. Also, the Titanic sister ship, the Britannic, sank on a mine in the 
Mediterranean were operating as a hospital ship. Now, there weren't uh, any, you know, hospital patients on board, mm -hmm. but it did sink rapidly after, you know, hitting a U-boat laid mine. Yeah. So there's that. In terms of overall numbers, to give you an idea of where we start with, in 1914, U-boats sink three merchant ships, which were stopped in scuttles after the crew got off. Yeah, so that's not exactly going to break the British merchant marine. <laughs> no, no, a couple of those were Norwegian even. But the totals for the war in general, number of ships sunk is over 6,600. Then you've got about another 700 damaged and 100 taken in as prizes, some of which are released, some of which are retained. Included in the list of ships sunk are 11 battleships, 18 cruisers, and over 30 destroyers. The amount of tonnage sunk is about 12 and a half million, including warships. And German U-boats sink many more ships in World War One than they do in World War Two. I mean, yeah, that's a that, that's a, that's a fair chunk. I mean, I'm imagining most of the obviously most, all those battleships are pre-dreadnoughts, but even so, that's a that, that's a fair chunk of uh, of warships. Well, the problem is that pre-dreadnought battleships and armored merchant, I mean, excuse me, armored cruisers have very limited ability to resist a minor torpedo hit. And there's some design features that make that worse. Their engine spaces are subdivided, um, you know, with a bulkhead down the middle. So if you get a torpedo mine hit on one side of the, of the ship, you know, basically the ship is going to capsize because it, the water does not naturally spread out throughout the entire engine space. It's just on one side. So you get a bad list to start a report and eventually the ship just goes over. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, yeah, I suppose if, you, yeah, if you've got that unequal flooding, the ship's going to roll over on its side a lot sooner than it's actually going to hit negative buoyancy. And then obviously when it goes over on its side, you get all the sort of useful bits and pieces like your gun casements that aren't really designed to be watertight now in the water. And, and then you start filling up rather distressingly fast. Yeah. So that, that's a known design problem with large warships, you know, from 10 or 20 years before the war. Hmm. Whereas the light cruisers built, you know, 1910 on are fairly good at absorbing damage. You can sink them, but you're going to have to put multiple torpedoes into them. Yeah. Which is interesting. Overall, tonnage sunk is 12.5 million tons, including warships. And basically, the amount of tonnage sunk in 1917, almost exactly equals what the Germans would sink with their U-boats in 1942. Oh, wow. So smaller, presumably at this point we're talking about smaller um, ships. Yes. Smaller U-boats, sorry, and yeah, and smaller targets. But they're, they're at, so that would indicate actually proportionally a much greater success rate. Yes. The top three scoring U-boats are World War One U-boats. The top two commanders are World War One commanders. See, we got that backwards. Top three commanders are World War One. Top two U-boats are World War One. World War One. Uh, uh, well, yeah. So I said. Uh... There's probably a, a good, good reason, good uh, sort of good motivation for Pete for the uh, tactics and technology to develop in between the wars to to fight submarines if they're yeah. that successful. Yeah, so it's it's big. And April 1917 is the high water mark of either war. Mm. 
that's when U-boats sink the most in any month. Interestingly enough. Yeah. So that so they they're doing pretty good work. Lots of and a lot of success in the, in their operations at that point. Um, so, how does the war affect the numbers and types of U-boat built? Because as as we said as you said earlier, they're starting the war with this relatively small fleet that's mainly designed to operate uh, as a uh, as, as an operational part of the the battle fleet. And now they're scoring massive amounts of success against merchant shipping, a lot of it presumably not so much in the North Sea and more out in the Atlantic. So I'm guessing between that and deck guns being installed and such, that they're, they're going to have changed the design and type of U-boats they're building. But I'm guessing they're also going to need a lot more of them. Yeah, they're well, it's complex. This is not quite as bad as zero nomenclature, but it's close. Uh, some of this stuff confuses people uh, to no end. So what they did was they ordered more of the existing U-series torpedo attack boats, you know, diesel-powered boats. Yeah. And these are, well, pre-war like 650-ton surfaced, 850 submerged. And pre-war, there are two yards of built submarines of that type in Germany. One is the Germania Waft in Kiel. The other is the Imperial Dockyard in Danzig, now Gdansk. So they only had two yards building submarines pre-war. They're going to bring in more yards, and they're going to have, you know, somewhat of an evolution or evolutionary approach to the larger U series boats without getting too much into the weeds. I mean, they're all, all those U series diesel boats are relatively similar in their capabilities. Some of the later ones have four um, bow torpedo tubes, and the deck gun armament may get up to a 105 millimeter and an 88 millimeter. But you know, that stuff's relatively the same. They also oh. work some large mine layers, which the less said about them, the better. They're the worst design of the war. So <laughs> they do have some successes. Uh, HMS Hampshire would be an example. Yeah. But uh, they're very unreliable and kind of pigs um, in how they handle. And also slow. But... Uh, Beyond that, they ordered smaller submarines. And this is where it gets confusing. So, they, you can think of it as being smallest, small, and medium. In coastal torpedo attack and coastal mine laying varieties. I'll start off with the stuff they ordered in like early 1915 with very short build times. Sure. Okay. The torpedo attack boats are in the UB series. The mine layers are in the UC series. This will get confusing because you're going to have, you know, as an example, a big U-boat, say U-30, you'll have a UB-30, you'll have a UC-30, and people endlessly uh, mistake these. To make it worse, you'll have an Austrian U-30, and then, of course, you'll have a World War II U-30 and a modern U-30. <laughs> Good luck keeping those straight. It's bad. Oh, yeah, the German boats in the Mediterranean are false flag with Austrian numbers, too, to make it completely so, so, confusing. Yes. So, so following that logic, you, you could find yourself in the Mediterranean genuinely actually sink 
for example, uh, a U-30 flying an Austrian flag, you could see it go down, you could pick up survivors, and the next day you could be sunk by another U-30 also flying an Austrian, Austro-Hungarian flag. Yeah, something like that, yeah. It's just strange. Very strange. And it, get, it gets worse, particularly since we're doing, you know, a chat like this, and I can't mm. write it out for you. But the UB and the UC classes, there are three each, are designated by Roman numerals, whereas both numbers are just normal numbers. Yeah. So, yeah, good luck with this. Okay. <laughs> right. On the, in, well, okay, first torpedo attack small class, or 1915, was the UB-1, Roman numeral 1. These have two torpedo tubes and are extremely small. As in, we're talking 127 tons surfaced. Okay, yeah, that is small. <laughs> yeah. I think I've been on yachts that are bigger than that. <laughs> yeah. It's powered by a 60 horsepower engine. Yeah. Yes. My car has more power than that. <laughs> I, I think my granddad's motorbike has more power than that. Yeah. Um, so these things are very small. The crew like 17 can be out for maybe a week, 10 days at most, and often less than that. They also build very small mine layers. They're fractionally bigger. 168 tons on the surface. 90 horsepower, and they carry 12 mines in six chutes, which are external to the pressure hull. And they use these a lot in 1915, and the survivors are still in service into 1918. Then 1916, they step up the game with their smaller submarines, the UB-2 class, this is UB boat numbers, UB 18 to UB 47. They built 30 of them. Mm -hmm. And the Austrians license build eight as well. These are up to 263 tons. Still not impressive. Mm. Well, they've got two diesel engines and they have two shafts. And they carry two torpedo tubes, but they can carry reload torpedoes, and they've got an 88 millimeter gun. These matter, more so because it can be used in broader areas. Then in 1916, we get to the UC2 class. This is boats number UC16 to UC79. We've got medium-sized submarines, 400 plus tons on the surface, top speed of 11 and a half knots, so you can outrun merchant ships. And they can do patrols of substantial duration. They've got 18 mines on board. They've got an 88 millimeter deck gun. They've got three torpedo tubes. They've got two propellers, twin rudders, and they're very important, both in the mine laying, but then they can also, after they drop their mines, or even before, they can be used as torpedo attack boats. The Germans in 1917 introduced the UB-3 class. This is a UC-2, slightly enlarged, but fitted as a pure torpedo attack boat. These are UB numbers 48 and up, over 500 tons. Mm -hmm. And they're used like the U diesel boats are. Very similar patrol profiles, basically. And a World War II Type 7 boat is just an improved 
enlarged version of a UB3. So the origins of your World War II most common U-boat type is a 1916 German mine laying submarine. Okay, that, now that's interesting because you would have thought the design lineage would come from the the bigger U U classes, but no, it's it's the UB three and for the UC two, the mm -hmm. World War Two Type Seven class even has the twin rudders. Oh, okay. Which is an important design feature if you ever have to identify racks. Yeah, for one of the things to look for. So. And overall, they, Germans would commission over 300 U-boats total of varying types. They would lose 178 plus six interned. So this is an attritional combat. We'll get yeah. into that later. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's sort of numbers and types. Um, so we've, we've, briefly mentioned of operational areas but so what were the main u-boat operational areas and uh, and how were these organized i mean obviously in world war ii you've got wolf packs and and such like but we already know that they're not under that level of command and control from the shore so yeah so whereabouts are these u-boats going and, and who who's sorting out their assignments okay you've got more confusion <laughs> Because, well, let's start off with the main area, and then we'll get to the secondary areas. Okay, you had U-boats based in Germany. They would be operated by the High Seas Fleet, Hochseeflotte, or HSF. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these were most, where most of the U-boats were based pre-war, and this was organized originally as two flotillas of two half flotillas each. In 1916, the half flotillas become flotillas. There's a fifth flotilla briefly. Um, but what those flotillas are doing is, well, a couple things. They're operating the U-series diesel boats and the large mine layers. And the patrols, if they're against merchant ships, are going to be, well, first thing we need to talk about is how they get to their patrol areas. Okay. So how can you get into the Atlantic? Well, if you're a U-boat, you're, well, the short route would be the English Channel, but that would probably be bad for your health in a lot of cases. So it'd be either that or... Bismarck style via the gap between Scotland and Iceland or Iceland and the Green and Greenland? Well, let's start off with going through Dover. Mm -hmm. They did this at certain times. Just in mind when we talk about Flanders. Uh, so they went through Dover until about April 1915. And then again with some exceptions, like February and March 1917, you know, the resumption of unrestricted submarine warfare. And then again, very late 1917 and early 1918. So sometimes they're going through Dover, but often not. Usually they're going around Scotland. Yeah, which makes it a bit, well, it's going to be a slightly less hazardous if somewhat longer trip. Uh, somewhat longer, particularly. Um, and, you know, they're doing month long patrols. Yeah. If, if they're on merchant ships. So that's what the U series boats are doing. You also have, however, a collection of smaller or older types that are used within the North Sea because they're also targeting shipping along the English and Scottish coast or between Britain and Norway. 
for Sweden and making sure that materials aren't getting to the UK from Norway, particularly wood. And, you know, they're stopping and sinking or sinking out of convoy, you know, that sort of Scandinavian trade. Yeah. And do you see two mine layers in 1917? Uh, do their own little weird thing. I mean, they're used, obviously, on mine laying missions, particularly against, uh, say, the Orkneys and Shetlands and along the Scottish coast in general. But they also are sent on these two week long patrols where they will go through Dover, lay mines off the Irish coast and then go back in via, you know, going around Scotland to get back to Germany. So we have that. We also got some UV2s along the English and Scottish coast. Okay. There's always a little bit of that. Think a month for the larger types. And as to how they're operating, well, a lot of commander's discretion. They will shift their patrol areas if they don't find uh, ships to sink or ships to attack. They will radio home. They will radio other U-boats. Mm -hmm. So they're trackable. Okay? Yeah. Now, we also have, from 1915 on, a separate command based out of occupied Belgian ports, Zeebrugge, Ostende, with a base also in Bruges. The Zeebrugge and Ostende are connected by Bru to Bruges by a channel, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of overhaul work in Bruges. The Flanders Command operates the varying UB and UC types. There are no big boats operated out of there, really. Okay. Yeah. Well, I suppose yeah, smaller, easier to manage in in the in the ports close to the front line at that point. Yeah, and they start off operating with the. UB1s and UC1s along the British East Coast on short patrols. The mine layers are obviously doing the mine laying thing. The uh, UB1s are targeting merchant ships with their torpedoes, and they're also stopping fishing vessels and sinking them with well, scuttling charges after stopping them with machine guns. Eventually, you get the UB2s from nine, late 1915, early 1916, particularly 1916, and they allow basically Flanders-based boats to operate into the English Channel. They're going through Dover. Then you get your UC2s later in 1916. They're going through Dover, also doing some English East Coast stuff, mainly as operational workups. But yeah, they're also offering through Dover in the English Channel into the Irish Sea, into the Bay of Biscay. And then UB3s in 19, you know, mid-1917. Yeah. Again, these are going to be Bay of Biscay, English Channel, Irish Sea, through Dover until the very end of the war, and patrols are about two weeks or so on average. Mm -hmm. And the amount of losses, and, or let me rephrase that, the amount of sinkings very interesting obviously because the larger boats based in Germany are out in the Atlantic they're encountering a lot of bigger ships 
so you get more much more tonnage whereas the flanders based boats are oftentimes uh they get smaller targets but they sink probably more ships on a per u-boat basis for the same types the flanders based boats sink more but they have higher casualties so let's go to the other places where they okay. are okay those germany-based high seas fleet boats also will occasionally operate in the arctic mm -hmm. so they're up there a little bit they're a little bit operating you know as far afield as like maybe off portugal and they're also, you know, in the Bay of Biscay, some. They're out in the Atlantic, some. And, uh, or primarily, really. Now, unsurprisingly, Germany also has a second front, and that's against Russia in the Baltic. And there are a small number of U-boats that operate in the Baltic until you know, the end of 1917 and, you know, Russia exiting the war, so they, you don't need any more U-boats there. Mm -hmm. But that's a sideshow, but there are some submarines there. Okay, then there's the Mediterranean and Black Seas. In 1917, excuse me, 1915, let me get it right, U-21 sails in, from Germany for the Mediterranean and manages to make it to Austria without refueling. It then, you know, tops up its tanks and goes, well, to Gallipoli. Ah, yes, well, target-rich environment. <laughs> yes, and it uh, takes out two British pre-dreadnoughts. Not bad. <laughs> That's a not yeah. bad rate of return for a couple of hundred tons of sub. Yeah. And that convinces the Germans to send more U-boats to the Mediterranean. What happens is you end up with a substantial German submarine presence in the Mediterranean operating out of Austrian ports. These are the boats that rack up the incredible numbers seven of the eight top scoring german submarines of world war one are operating in the mediterranean and that environment is great for them because all you've got to do is sail out of the adriatic and gee what's just south of there Ooh, shipping routes <laughs> and they you know the ships are coming essentially almost to them so they can rack up tremendous numbers and then they can operate throughout the mediterranean and i suppose in the mediterranean albeit that it is a sea there are certain choke points and it is overall a much smaller environment so there's fewer places for the ships to go as opposed to the atlantic where they could be almost anywhere yes and it's called malta <laughs> so the approaches to Malta mm. in that area are very heavily patrolled by German and also some Austrian submarines get out and have some fun in 1917 as well. But the Germans also will send their U-boats into the eastern and western Mediterranean and even go through the Strait of Gibraltar back into the Atlantic for a couple days. Because Atlant because Gibraltar is not one way in World War One. The UC twos and UB threes happen to have enough range so they can also sail from Germany to the Adriatic. So they're showing up there in 1917 and 1918 as well. As for the smaller types, those really small things. A number of those are sent via rail, the disassembled, sent via rail to Austria and reassembled. Flat pack U boat. Yeah. And then they're operating a little bit in the Mediterranean, 
but they then oftentimes are sailed to Constantinople and some of them then operate in the Black Sea in from you know 1915 on. So you get U-boats in the Baltic and Black Sea against Russia as well as up north. So that's where we how we can get our you know air attack in 1916 credited with sinking a U-boat when it really didn't. Okay. And which starts this long discussion. Yeah. And we'll prob- probably come on to that a little bit later on in a little bit more detail. <laughs> Although obviously probably not the the full the full, uh, full um accounting. Yeah. And the last thing we have are U cruisers. So Germany decides they are going to build some submarines to trade with the United States. And obviously two of these are complete in 1916. To, and one of these, the Deutschland, makes two trips to the U.S. And the second boat disappears. We'll get into disappearing submarines later. Yeah. But the Germans actually had ordered six more of these, which they decide to convert into U-cruisers, which is to say very large for the time submarines that have a very heavy deck gun armament limited torpedo armament uh they're they're going to send out and try to overwhelm ships with their deck guns and you know the seven of these are used from 1917 on then they also build specialized u cruisers they're much bigger much faster and two of them see service late in the war so these boats will patrol off the African coast and they will come across the Atlantic to operate off the U.S. and Canadian coast in 1918. So that's a lot more of an unusual operational environment for the U-boats in World War One than it would be in, in World War Two. Yeah. But it's very good for getting me speaking engagements out along the North Carolina coast which is as far south as they got. Okay. And the most significant kill is the armored cruiser USS San Diego, which is mined off Fire Island, New York, in July 1918, July or August, Mm -hmm. the date. So, you know, there is a small U.S. presence, but not a lot. No. Okay, so so they they they're really all all over the the place, except for possibly the Indian Ocean, I guess. So yeah. you, you, there's a good chance of encountering a U-boat almost anywhere. Um, yeah. well, but you know they're not out as far into the Atlantic. No, it's yeah. a couple hundred miles out for the standard boat. As so opposed, it's, yeah. It's, as opposed, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's less oceanic than World War Two. Yeah, so there's well, I suppose they don't have to worry about aircraft quite so much. So they're not going to be okay. sort of pushing themselves out into the mid Atlantic to escape patrolling flying boats and such like. Yeah, very yeah. true. Um, so with all those operational areas, I know you, we you you mentioned specifically that there was a, a Flanders unit as well as the the German based units under the control of the High Seas Fleet. Did the, both of those flotillas, fleets, I guess, whatever we want to call them, were they using the same kind of doctrines or, or were they running under different kinds of operational invi- uh, orders? Um, almost completely distinct. So you've got the high seas fleet boats doing their thing and, you know, once you get into patrols against merchant shipping flanners it's doing its own separate thing and we have to keep this in mind because it's something that people miss so high seas fleet boats the big boats sometimes they go through dover sometimes they don't they tend to radio a lot flanders boats pretty much always go through dover 
their operational doctrine is not to radio home. Okay, that's interesting because they, they, I mean, I've covered in other videos that one of the failings of the high seas fleet itself was its tendency to effectively shout in all caps across the radio frequencies exactly what it was doing at almost every given moment which made keeping an eye on it somewhat easier which is probably not something you want to be doing when you're when when you're uh, sailing in a u-boat but it sounds like the, the flanders flotilla had figured that that bit out at least and uh, were, were keeping a bit quieter Oh, yeah, they're definitely keeping quiet, and that's going to have some consequences when we get into sinking attributions because, well, the British have problems tracing them, obviously. Yeah. As for the high seas fleet, they did radio a lot. Uh, this is where Room 40 intercepts become somewhat relevant as in, you know, we sometimes will hear people talk about, you know, trying to ambush U-boats. It's always going to be a high seas fleet boat, or in one case, it's a U-cruiser. It's almost never going to be about Flanders. And I'm not entirely convinced that people there writing these, you know, accounts about how influential room 40 is and how important radio intercepts are and i'm not sure that, that they are aware that uh flanders boats didn't radio hmm. oh, sure. so, i suppose that, that that leads to an interesting an interesting point because obviously in the run-up to the battle of jutland one of the one of the reasons that the British knew something big was in the offing was because they were via, via Room 40 intercepting various reports that indicated U-boats from the High Seas Fleet were moving into areas in, in and around the British main anchorages at Scatter yeah. and Rosseth. But yeah, from the but... sounds of it, then, if, 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 the, if the Germans had asked, that, say, the Flanders flotilla to deploy their ships, their boats, um, that 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 interception well wouldn't have happened because there wouldn't have been signals to intercept which would have complicated matters somewhat uh the flanders boats were used to support some actions in uh 1916 mm -hmm. like the uh april raid what is it scarborough or yeah yeah the, I remember the... scarborough <laughs> even though most british people probably would rather not yeah, so there are some Flanders boats are used in support of that, but they, you know, they would not typically radio while on patrol. So it, it's an important distinction to keep in mind. Okay, so yeah, so they're using very different doctrines, and you mentioned that this this leads to problems with uh, U-boat loss attribution. So. How exactly did U-boats end up being lost, obviously, in an era that predates sonar? Um, hunting via escorts and destroyers is obviously going to be a slightly different uh, slightly different environment. And get, when, when they are lost, how accurate is the information recorded about their, their, the lot cause of loss at the time? Uh, I guess mostly by the people who thought that they'd killed them. Okay, let's start off with how you can sink a submarine. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. What is a submarine? It is intended to be a stealth weapon. You're not supposed to know where it is. And it is a boat that is capable of going underwater. Well, that's kind of important. Why? What do you do when you sink a ship? You are making it go underwater, right? Yeah. So the question is, that submarine that's going down, is it because it's sinking or is it because it's diving? <laughs> to get away from you who's, who are trying to sink it. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the issues. But more generally, 1914... No one had really thought about anti-submarine warfare yet. Submarines were a new weapon, 
And only in the last few years do they have substantial operational capacity. You know, they've finally gotten to being not primitive and an actual useful weapon system. Okay, so how can you sync this thing? Well, the most important way are mines. Okay. Best anti-submarine weapon in 1914. Best anti-submarine weapon in 1918. Still incredibly significant in 1939 and 1945. Mines sink submarines, period. Mm. Yeah, so I suppose I suppose Jellico experimenting with uh, uh, early depth charges and and uh, anti submarine mines using the kind of capital ship killers probably helped with that because I'm imagining a yeah an explosive charge in a mine that's designed to blow the bottom out of a twenty thousand ton plus dreadnought is probably not going to leave that much left of a of a few hundred tons of submarine. The, the well, a couple interesting things the. British mines, you know, early war were horrible, mm -hmm. very reliable, and it's only 1917 that the mine quality gets better, and that's because they reverse engineered German mines. <laughs> uh, so the Germans, you know, pay a lot more attention to mine laying. And the other thing is, in 1918, you start to get into British laying magnetic mines. That's not the big thing, but you also have the Americans uh, laying what's called the Northern Barrage to keep U-boats from getting out into the Atlantic. And those are very interesting mines because they are technically contact mines, but it's not, you know, submarine bumps into mines, sets off Hertz horns. They have these long glass ball things the submarine touches that, sets off the acid down at the mine, and sets the thing off. So they function much like magnetic mines. So that's the other novel technology late in the war. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, so our wonderful classic spiky mine um, is being superseded already. Yes. Yes. So mines are really important. What else? How else can you sink a submarine? Well, if it's on the surface, by gunnery, you can shell it. Yeah. And the variant on shelling it is the Q-ship or decoy vessel. We've got something that pretends to be a merchant ship. It's really armed. But, um, you know, it... It plays helpless. The U-boat gets too close, and the hidden guns open fire and sink the submarine. This is a very important anti-submarine weapon from 1915 through early 1917. As the war changes, as merchant ships are defensively armed, as you have convoys and as U-boats can, well, simply torpedo things without restriction, Q-ships become very ineffective in 1917. The Germans have got figured out. And if they think something's a Q-ship, they're not going to go up and fight the gun engagement they think's coming. They're just going to put a torpedo into it. So Q-ships effective early, late in the war, the exchange rate is very unfavorable for the Allies there. Mm -hmm. You can also then get into submarines, as in a submarine of one country attacking a submarine of another country. Yeah. So... British and French submarines or were used successfully against German submarines and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You, in a couple of cases, combine two ships and submarines. 
So you'd have a trawler towing a small submarine. When the U-boat appeared, then the tow was cut and the British submarine would try to torpedo the German submarine. That worked twice in 1915. You'll see some weird movie references to it. Okay, so we've got gunnery. We've got submarines. How else can you sink a submarine? You can ram it. Yep, that tends to go fairly well. <laughs> it, there's, it happened more than you think. And by some fairly large ships. I mean, a U-boat was run over by the Olympic, the Titanic <laughs> sister ship. You mean a Titanic-class vessel that, well, I guess an Olympic-class vessel that didn't sink when it hit something. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And HMS Dreadnought <clears throat> did ram and sink a U-boat. Yeah, I bet Admiral Fisher was glad the ram bell was on that, that particular boat that day. <laughs> and you've got, I think, about eight or so. Mm -hmm. cases in which target vessels like cruisers, battleships, merchant ships, rammed U-boats. So that would happen. More I suppose, than yeah, I, I suppose if you, if you spot a periscope or a, or a conning tower or something, it's, if it's close enough range, it's, well, you can't, you can't, can't, it can't hurt to give it a go. <laughs> right. There's that, or it, let's say it's at night. Yes. Visibility's bad, and all of a sudden, you know, through the fog, you see in front of you a submarine. Uh, you know, you just throw your helm over and run it over, you know, when it's on the surface. Yeah. So, well... Oftentimes, the U-boat will try to dive, and, you know, that makes the ramming a little bit more effective, even. But, you know, that happened a fair amount. Yeah. So then we get into more active anti-submarine warfare methods. 1916, we have the death charge introduced, and that's going to be fairly significant. So originally in small quantities. Yeah, because I suppose before before then, if a submarine manages to successfully dive, there's not a tremendous amount you can do other than wait around and hope it pops back up again. Correct. Correct. Though sometimes you'll find that um, the U-boat commander may be a little bit overly aggressive and try to pop up and torpedo, hmm. so it gets rammed. That happened occasionally. So we get into the in-depth charges. We also have explosive paravanes, but those are best ignored because they didn't <laughs> work well. There's yeah. one success, and it's early. And then, of course, we also have airplanes, which are not as effective as their proponents claimed. Okay. It's about half as much. And it's, and it's not a particularly high number to start with. No, no. It's, all, it's pretty much all Flanders to start with, actually. Mm -hmm. Is that because of well, just the proximity with the short range of aircraft, or yes. the small size of the subs makes them more vulnerable, or a bit of both? Uh, well, remember, Flanders is operating off the Belgian coast and then through Dover. So that Belgian coast area is where a lot of those engagements take place. Mm -hmm. so the most, the one that we know absolutely is successful is actually off the Isles of Scilly. Okay. With the one of the crew members going on to become an Anglican bishop after the mm -hmm. war. <laughs> Weird, but true. So, yeah. Is that okay? So, um, so we've got the various methods of sinking, and did did they usually get it right? How I mean, we've uh, in the in the zero video we talked about how how sort of ridiculous some of the over overestimates were. Was was that kind of 
a, an issue when it came to sinking U-boats, people thinking they'd sunk a lot more than they actually had, or did they usually tend to get it a little bit more on the, on the ball? Uh, it's a problem. It's a big problem. Mm -hmm. So this is what the British did during the war. They're trying to play along. So they got basically four primary sources of information. Obviously, you've got U-boat sightings, mm -hmm. you've got sinkings of ships by U-boats, you've got U-boats attacking ships, maybe not successfully. So you're plotting that out. And gee, if you have some sort of engagement and all of a sudden the U-boat doesn't do anything else after that, maybe you can assume you sank the U-boat. Fair assumption. Yeah. Of course, this is also going to be constrained by limited patrol lengths for the U-boats. Um, then, of course, you've got radio transmissions, and the British did have the codes from Room 40, etc., so they had an idea of what U-boat and what it was saying sometimes. And then, of course, we've got survivor statements, prisoners of war. So you might sink a U-boat, you might take prisoners and then interrogate them. And they, you know, they might say, oh yeah, I had a buddy of mine and he disappeared like six months ago on a, off you whatever. Yeah. So they're getting dates for missing submarines from that. Of course, the danger there is that people may misremember things. Dates can be off, or even what boat somebody was on could be off. And lastly, you've got wrecks, U-boat wrecks. The British discovered a number of sunken German submarines during the war. They dived them and were able to recover documents from them, a lot of which proved useful in piecing things together. So what happens is they have a file called Report Destruction Submarines where they've got the descriptions of all their anti-submarine warfare attacks, and then they have how likely they thought it was that a U-boat was sunk, and then if sunk, which U-boat? Okay. So yeah, they're playing along. And then after the war, what happens is they publish these attributions, like 1919, and start paying out prize money to the crews, the ships, and planes involved based on the information they had. And okay. they did not present a lot of uncertainty in these accounts. It wasn't, well, we think we may have sunk this U-boat. It was, we sank this U-boat. And this is presumably without actually checking with the Germans. No. As to, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that kind of, actually, that kind of reminds me of, uh, oh, I forget which, who, which exact book it was, but the, there's a, there's a book I was reading recently that was published in, I think, 1919 or 1920, mm -hmm. uh, sort of naval proceedings of, of World War One, And when you get to the section on Jutland, even though that is, even that that's a single battle that at that point's been sort of three or four years past, and you go through that and it's still talking about, well, this German battleship was sunk that German battleship was sunk, this one was seen on fire and was probably sunk, and half the first scouting group was sunk. And you're sitting there going, um, some of these ships actually turned up at Scapa Flow in 1919. Yeah. They should have corrected this. Well, it gets worse, actually. Oh. Yeah. Um, so some of these accounts, if you read them, 
are a little bit less than convincing. They're kind of like, maybe, but the British didn't present them as maybes in the popular press. So you'd have essentially official leaks or press release versions, you know, they hand it out to mm -hmm. the press, where kind of the more marginal sinking claims are presented as being overwhelming because they threw in some details not found otherwise of things like, oh, yes, we know we sank this U-boat because, you know, we had body parts observed or something. Yeah. So one of the challenges is getting to clean versions of these sinking attributions or these battles, mm -hmm. these actions. Or uh, unenhanced have... ones. <laughs> yes, yes. So that that's critical because there are a couple of cases that were enhanced where um, they don't hold up very well. But you, as we found out recently, but you've got to get away from the enhanced element of it. Yeah. To see and... that. Otherwise, you're always going to accept it. Yeah, and and so with, with this, did the Germans notice problems with this kind of thing? Because if the British if the British are leaking it and saying, "Oh yes, well we've got, uh, we've sunk this, this, and this," I, I'm guessing the Germans, if they're looking at going, "Well, we've got a couple of these submarines back in port safely," and the British seem to think they've sunk them. I'm presuming there's some some kind of uh, tactical or strategic opportunity they could exploit using subs that are pre presumably well that they they have more submarines than the British now think they've got. Well, it, it, were they able to exploit that? Well, I mean the British. I mean, the Germans are using the submarines they had aggressively as you know as much as they could. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the British would misattribute uh, something to where, you know, we sank it, you know, in October 1917, it was actually lost, you know, some months later. But that, that's not the big thing. The, yeah. the problem is really the attributions post-war. The British, I mean, had a pretty good idea from survivor statements and the like about how many U-boats had been destroyed. It just right. made, you know, they may have been guessing as to exactly when, not that they presented that as a guess post war. Yeah. So, but the Germans certainly post war uh, saw the British attributions because they're in the press, they're everywhere. Yeah. And their reaction was something along the lines of, what? <laughs> what is going on here? And there's a great quote. It's in the file from um, U88. And I'll, I'll read it to you. So this is uh, January 1922. Mm -hmm. A staff officer is writing to a colleague about U22, which was credited excuse me, U-88, let me get it right, U-88, which is credited by the Royal Navy as sunk the Atlantic by the Q-ship Stonecrop on September 17, 1917. U-88 was commanded by Kapitän Leutnant Walter Schwieger. Recognize the name? Uh, he rings a bell. He's the U-boat commander that sank the Lusitania. Ah. And Schwiega was the seventh most successful U-boat commander of World War I by tonnage. Mm -hmm. So, here is the quote. You know, we've got this attribution of stone crop. Okay. As English awarded prize money, it's probable that stone crop wanted to claim this. Wasn't there a special bounty put on Schwiega? The many English U-boat sinking misattributions, e.g. the Flanders flotilla boats, 
justify the conclusion that here too, the desire for prize money motivated the stone crop claim. How did the English know that it was U88? Did they take prisoners? Where are they? Further research on the German side showed that Stonecrop actually engaged U-151, mm -hmm. which he had, had escaped. So, so they, they got the boat wrong and they also didn't sink it. Yeah, but also, you know, the broader question the Germans have is, you know, how do the British know? Mm -hmm. And obviously, they are concerned that a lot of these attributions are wrong, particularly Flanders. So, what happens? The Germans are looking at the list. They're thinking it's got problems with it. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't immediately publish their list of gripes or concerns or whatever. What they and the British both do is start writing official histories. On the German side, this is, you know, the Krieg zur See series, which are, you know, famous and essential reading for doing a lot of naval research. And for the British side, it's the naval staff monographs. Neither side, though, completes these before the start of the Second World War. The Germans on the submarine side against merchant shipping, it's called Handelskrieg mit U-Booten by Admiral Arnold Spindler. Mm -hmm. They published the fourth volume, which covers February 1917 through December 1917 in 1940 or 41. It's a classified document. Okay. The naval staff monographs, those are also classified. And the Royal Navy gets through July 1917. The two sides are talking to each other, or I should say mailing each other, and discussing events, but the exchange of information is far from complete. So this is where some of the misattributions and reattributions start to show up, but they're classified. Ah, uh, right. So they've been. So there's no real opportunity for the, someone on the other side to correct them. Well, I mean, they're right. They're writing to each other. Oh, yeah. So yeah, the Germans, you know, are asking questions. The British are asking questions. There's some exchange of information. It's not complete. But if there's something fundamentally wrong, it may get caught. Okay. But it's not as transparent as a, a sort of more open. No, no. And they do miss things. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes they, you know, there are a couple of gotcha moments that I've come across, most of which got found, but aren't necessarily interpreted correctly. Now, what happens after that? It's about 1918. Mm -hmm. The Germans finally publish the last volume of Hunnels Creek in 1966. Wow. So there, there is an entire world war and what, a couple of decades between, between the, that and the publication date. Yeah. Yep. So almost a half century after the events. What's about people who are not, you know, official Navy members getting access to information? Well, it's the mid 1960s before Robert Grant is the first person to basically access uh, the files. Mm -hmm. Should also mention that, of course, Germany uh, does not surrender in World War I. It's an armistice. Yeah. 
they get to hold on to their documents. Obviously, after World War or during World War II, things are a bit different. The British capture the German naval archives in 1945. The British allow the Americans to microfilm these. The documents are returned to Germany in the 1960s. And to this day, you can get copies of the microfilm that you know, the Americans made from the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration, that are pricey. Yeah. So it's going to be a while before anyone gets access to this. To this information can yeah. be a set. And there'd be quite a lot of it, I'm imagining, at that point. Yeah, well, the other thing is, what's more interesting in the 1960s or 1970s or 1980s, mm. World War One or World War II? Yes, I suppose, yeah, that's, that's the point. <laughs> yeah, so we've basically had a lack of, you know, research into this information that's now become available into a lot say the last 20 years and much of what has been um, done has been motivated in some cases by wreck discoveries. It's also worth noting that German official history, uh, some people are not aware it exists. Okay. Yeah. It, and I see this a lot. This is this tops my personal list of gripes. There are still people today who are using the 1919 British list of attributions. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, yeah, which, as I said, is a, it, it's in that same classic era of, of documentation as yes, we sunk SMS Kaiser, honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, it's just the mess. Uh, in particular. We've got Belgian divers finding wrecks because, you know, Flanders. Mm, yep. Uh, the German official history apparently uh, is unknown in Belgium. No one's heard of it. No oh, one's wow. referenced it. Yeah. And there are a number of academics in the UK and some, and some people in positions that matter more than academia, mm -hmm. um, cultural heritage, etc., that also have not heard of the German official history or find it convenient to ignore it. And, you know, it's very frustrating when you have to uh, explain to people that uh, no, this U-boat cannot be where you say you're looking for it because it was assigned to operate someplace else. Yeah. It would never be there. Never in a million years. <laughs> Please stop this. <laughs> you know, but uh, I still see it. I've seen it in papers published, academic papers published two years ago. You know, it, it's very frustrating. Yeah, so where, they're, where they're kind of like, well, we, we, we quote unquote know that, I guess, pulling a random example, we know that we sunk this submarine off the, the coast of Brittany, and you're probably looking at it going, um, uh, it was in the Baltic. Uh, Brittany is not known for being in the Baltic. <laughs> that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, or it's um, off the English East Coast for a UC2 mine layer. Mm hmm that would you know which is not some place that, that sort of submarine would operate uh to because that's too close in for that valuable ship and would be used and was assigned to operate in the bay of biscay yeah okay and it, yeah it's sort of it's that sort of stuff yeah you know it's very it's very common unfortunately mm -hmm. I'd like to say it's getting better. It's probably getting better on discussion boards. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, you know, we've, you know, I do U-Boat.net stuff. I do the World War One side of it. 
Mm -hmm. I like to think we've cut down the misattributions, you know, because we're serving as a reference, but yeah. some people don't use it. Um, and some people, you know, for whatever reason. Oh no, it's on the internet. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things in the internet that that aren't true too. Mm. Yeah, which fair enough. And some of that actually uh, I can think of a Wikipedia page that mm -hmm. uh, you know didn't get updated that you know influenced a submarine identification that luckily turned out to be correct, but it didn't have to be. Mm. Involving a British submarine. Okay. You know, so it it, it happens. It, it gets back into some other issues we'll talk about later. Um, on we'll talk about um, missing boats and identifications and things like that. Yeah. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.